Hello everyone, this is Shannon from That So Po, and today I'm here with my husband, Sush. Hello. And we are going to be talking about the novellas that have been nominated for the 2020 Hugo Awards. So if you're not familiar with it, the Hugo Awards are awards given for books in speculative fiction, science fiction and fantasy by the World Science Fiction Convention or WorldCon. Um, so Sush and I are reading this year for four categories. There are many, many different categories within the Hugos. We're reading for the novels, novellas, novelettes, and short stories. And today we're gonna to be talking about the six finalists for the novella category, ranking them according to my ratings, since I give ratings and Sush doesn't really do ratings so much, um, from sort of the least favorite to the most favorite. There are many, many strong novellas this year, so really all of these were quite good, but we'll go ahead and talk about them. We're gonna go ahead and try to avoid spoilers as much as possible, um, but there might be a little bit of slippage here and there, so just warning you ahead of time, but our main focus will be on talking about kind of our impressions and some of the themes and things that we liked and disliked. Okay, so the first book that I will talk about is my least favorite, which was This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal al Mutar and Max Gladstone. This is actually a book that I DNF'd, so I will talk about it as much as I'm able to from what I have read of it and what I know of it, but I did DNF at about the 30% mark, so she did the same. So we'll talk about what we got of it from what we read. So this story is set in sort of a very different future that is maybe not necessarily connected to Earth. And in that, there are two competing sides in a time war. And we follow two agents, red and blue, who are both for these different agencies trying to go back and change different aspects of the timeline. So this story is told through a series of vignettes of these periods in worlds and histories where the agents have gone back and they're trying to affect something in the timeline. These vignettes are very fantastical, really very vivid, um, very short uh, descriptions of a period in time and what that agent is doing, but they are also interspersed with letters between the agents, first taunting and then later getting to know one another. I believe later in the book these turn into love letters and a relationship between the two agents. This is a queer love story, although I did not get that far in the book. So I think that what this book has to offer is some interesting themes. I do really like the emphasis on sort of futility of war. In this, because we have these two agents who are constantly fighting against each other and trying to change the timeline only to find out that the other agent has already foiled their attempts. There's a big feeling of futility in their efforts to change something and instead they're always kind of one-upping the other. There's also this feeling of really they both are so similar and so why are they even on opposite sides? So there's just this feeling that war itself is futile. There's also a theme of the bystander damage. So many times when they're going into these different worlds, different timelines to affect things, they're really affecting the people there and there's quite a lot of um, collateral damage that happens. I'm not positive if that's a theme that was intended by the authors, but it's definitely something that I noticed just how much was destroyed in their efforts to change the timeline. So those are interesting themes. I think that my main impressions of it, though, are a little meh. This is not a book that I disliked by any means. I just was never fully engaged in it. So although I found that the vignettes themselves, when the agents were going into these very unique, interesting worlds and parts of history, were they were just so vivid and so creative. I love that world building. It was every single vignette was different. So there was nothing that kind of cumulatively worked up in terms of those vignettes. Now the letters between the characters, between the two agents are something that changed over time, but those were my least favorite parts of the story. There was a sense of humor that really didn't work for me um, in those letters. I'm very sensitive to styles of humor and this one just didn't work for me. And there's also just um, a lack of really engagement for me. I never really felt connected to the story. So even though 
I thought the themes were interesting and even though I thought that the world building was very interesting, I never got drawn into the story. And so at about 30%, I just decided I had no desire to see what happened in the rest of the book. But um, I'm sure that if somebody else really got along with the writing style, which is very poetic and flowery in a lot of ways, then they might be interested enough to continue. Yeah. I think for me, a uh, very similar experience. Um, I, I also DNF somewhere between 30 and 40 percent mark. Um, the world building I like, but each world they created was just thrown away and discarded. And that to me felt like those were pointless and therefore then I could never get invested in those mm -hmm. world building chapters. And then the letters themselves didn't work for me, which meant that I couldn't get engaged or invest in the characters. And I think for me, characters and world building is really, are really important. And so I didn't connect to the story. And I think that this is one of those books that I've seen very varied reviews about. There's some people who just love this book so much. And I think that part of it is simply if that writing style works for you. It is very stylized and in some ways kind of literary. Um, so if you start reading this book and you find that you're just thoroughly engaged in that writing style, it might be really good for you. I've also heard that some people found it really picked up after the 30% mark, so it's very possible that we both de-enacted a little too early, but it was not at all a bad book to be our least favorite. It was still quite good. It's just that didn't really engage us enough to continue. Next up, we have To Be Taught If Fortunate by Becky Chambers. So this was a book, um, this is a book about space exploration in a sense. Uh, it is also a book about humanity in a sense. Um, and it tries to uh, drive this story, this narrative through uh, an analogy of insect metamorphosis for me. Uh, right at the beginning of the story, they talk about, you know, phases of life of an insect and they basically talk about how uh, you may have a caterpillar that comes out of an egg and it basically gorges itself on life. And then at some point of time, it wraps itself in a cocoon and basically dissolves itself and then comes out of the cocoon like a butterfly to kind of live out a different stage of life. And so basically, and it kind of compares that uh, and it uses that structure, I think, to kind of talk about the rest of the story. And it, it is kind of a story in a sense for me of how our experiences shape us. It's a story about how our experiences inform our choices, our ethics, and all these sort of things. There's also one more foundational concept in this book, uh, which I think is really neat, and that is a concept of something they call soma forming. Uh, you've heard of terraforming from various other science fiction books where you have this idea that you change another, uh, what do you say, planet to suit human life. Uh, soma form forming then is the opposite idea of changing your own physical body in order to adapt to that planet that you're going to. And so I think there's there's a lot of humility in that and that's a neat concept uh, where you're not constantly just trying to reshape everything to suit you, you're uh, open to the idea of reshaping yourself to suit uh, a new en environment. And I think that's uh, something that I took a lot from in a sense. And in a sense, there's a lot in this book that is about uh, ethics of exploration, uh, about uh, colonization, and cases where you're basically trying to say, uh, what is the price of knowledge? Is it, mm -hmm. and, and it tries to basically, uh, uh, you know, take an example of if you were to make some, uh, go into some environment and explore, and you disturb that environment and you change that environment, um, what uh, what do you say, uh, uh, what responsibility do you have towards that? And then there's also this notion of you may make the case that it's it's in the interest of greater knowledge and, you know, uh, pain of the few to kind of uh, suit the needs of many, a topic which I found uh, explored in other books in this list as well. Um, but then the question is one of consent, where it's a sacrifice only if the things facing the pain consent to that, right? And so it kind of tries to uh, gently explore some of these topics. So I think in terms of 
themes. These are the kinds of themes that it basically tries to explore. And it does, I think, a really good job of that. Uh, it traces a story of uh, four explorers that are basically going uh, on uh, a decades long exploration of basically four different planets and they basically will change themselves to suit each of those planets and the insect metamorphosis metaphor really really spoke to me in how the uh, what do you say explorers basically change themselves in each of these uh, areas. So I think that uh, I, I think this book is a very solid science fiction book in that sense, in terms of the exploration of the what if. Um, I think it, there, in terms of themes, it explores colonizing, uh, what do you say, uh, ethics, uh, exploration ethics, I should say. Um, and basically, it also talks about how experiences change you. Uh, there is definitely more than a subtle linkage to how trauma can change you and completely Irrevocably, irrevocably change you. Uh, so I think I liked a lot of that. And I think that uh, I, I don't really give star ratings in quite the same way, but um, this book, in terms of my impressions of it, uh, there are many books which are, say, four star books because they are thoroughly enjoyable but not excellent. And then there are other four star books which are excellent but don't quite deliver and leave you wanting or uh, you know, are not satisfactory in some respect. And my impression is very much of the latter. Whereas for me, this was a four star book, but sort of more the former. Like I liked a lot of the themes that this explored. I loved the atmosphere. I loved the world building. Each of the four worlds mm -hmm. that the explorers go to is very fascinating and different. I loved the sort of, it's, it's a love letter to science. It's a love letter to research and exploration. Um, and it's also a philosophical discussion. So for me, I really liked so much of that. But uh, also like the previous book, I just never found myself fully immersed and engaged. Um, definitely, I was more engaged in this book and I had more of an interest in what the questions that were being asked were. But I think that it kind of fell a little short in making me care too deeply about the, the characters themselves. Um, I also think that this is something that is very decisive, divisive, divisive, um, in terms of the way that people react to it because the way that this ends is a little controversial. Um, it was very interesting because both Sush and I did not have problems with the ending, but we just had kind of other issues with it that kept it from being really a five-star read. I think for me, uh, it was kind of like three-fourths way through the book rather than at the end of the book. Yeah. yeah. I think um, when Sush was talking about it with me when he originally read it, that analogy mm -hmm. to the life cycle of the caterpillar was actually very strong throughout a lot of this, mm -hmm. but then it didn't quite follow through. It, for me, the butterfly didn't emerge and fly on. I, I didn't see the butterflies section yeah. in a sense. Yeah, but it did have a lot of really fascinating discussions of ethics and just sort of philosophy of, of exploration and research that were really a lot of fun to read. Now, before I start talking about the next book, I want to point out that the remaining four books on this list are all books that I gave five stars and I truly loved every single one of them. So ranking these was extremely hard and I'm not even sure that this is always and forever going to be my ranking of these books. Um, but I did my best to rank them somewhat within all of them being absolute favorites. So truthfully, I think I would be happy if any of these won the Hugo because I really loved them. So with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next one, which is In an Absent Dream by Shauna McGuire. This is the fourth book in the Wayward Children series, which is a series about portal fantasies. And this book in particular follows a character introduced in the first book, which is Lundy. It follows Lundy when she's a child and discovers a portal to the goblin market. So as a child, um, I think it takes place maybe in the 50s, something around that time, uh, she is very much not somebody who fits in in the real world. She's all about her books and she's very determined. She knows what she wants. She doesn't approve of a lot of things. And she goes into the goblin market and finds a world that is based on rules. 
everything there is very systematic and the magic system is super logical and it enforces a lot of different rules magically. And the story follows her as she splits her time between the real world and her family there and her life in the goblin market where she's having adventures and making friends and sort of growing, um, finding a place for herself. So this book had so many great themes. I really, really liked the themes in this book. One of the huge themes in this is that of choice. So constantly in this book, Lundy is having to make choices and it's really exploring her process of making those choices and the impact of those choices, especially the consequences of those choices. Because this goblin market is all about enforcing things through magic, choices have a really big impact. Another big theme is that of fairness because this is something that is magically enforced. Um, whenever people do something, the magic enforces that they make fair bargains. So if you're trying to trade something with somebody else, it must be a fair trade or else the magical system will punish you. One of the interesting things about that is that this uh, world that Maguire has built considers fairness not just in terms of like a one-to-one -one trade, but really in terms of what is an equal trade given the person's situation. So when Lundy is very young and new to the goblin market, she doesn't have to use very many resources in order to trade for something because she doesn't have very many resources. But as she gets older, the cost of things becomes more. So it's just a very interesting look at what makes something fair. Um, another thing that's really important in this magical system is responsibility and obligation. So when you make a bargain with someone or when you make a promise, you must fulfill that obligation or else you will be punished by the magic itself. So there's so much in here in terms of what are our responsibilities to people? What are our obligations? How do we fulfill that? How do we um, what kind of consequences do we have if we don't fulfill those obligations? And Lundy in this is dealing a lot with making choices, trying to make sure that they are fair, and dealing with the obligations that she signs up for. So, so many of those themes are just really, really fascinating, and I love the way that this interesting world is used to explore those concepts. Overall, I think one of the kind of overarching themes of this is just growing up and learning how to be a responsible, fair person who interacts with others in a way that fulfills sort of your social obligation. So I just, I really like that this was codified in the magic system um, and how her personal experience was used to guide us through this. I think that for me, this is probably my favorite book in the Wayward Children series simply because I loved that exploration of ethics and ideas and also I love the atmosphere. This has such a gentle, dark fairy tale feel and it's really um, sort of a slow novel. There are scenes of action that happen in this book, but mainly we don't watch those. We see the beginning and we might see the end, but often we're not visible. We don't, we don't have visibility into the action itself because that's not what the book is about. The book is really about Lundy's growth as a person, um, becoming an adult and understanding all of these issues of fairness and responsibility. So that really works for me, maybe not for everybody else, but I just adored that. And I got very, very invested in Lundy as a character. I loved the world building. I loved the atmosphere. I loved the themes. I just thoroughly enjoyed this book. I'm afraid I have a slightly contrary opinion in that I enjoyed the book fine, but it didn't wind up uh, speaking to me and I'm actually a little surprised by that because going into the book, uh, Lundy was a character I kind of really connected to, or at least I thought I did, in that she felt for me a very similar character to me. And then she wound up taking a lot of decisions that I wouldn't take. And then that divergence basically uh, would, uh, killed a little bit of that immersion for me. Uh, there's also another thing which is, the, I've been thinking of portal fantasies itself from a perspective of things like emigration, 
And one of the things that a lot of Indian diaspora face coming to the US, for example, is this uh, connection to India and uh, is this question of do you go back to India mm -hmm. and it's like do you go back home and then at some point of time you notice that your definition of home has shifted and uh, frequently they, uh, uh, the diaspora also go through another set of uh, uh, changes after they have kids where they mm -hmm. want to connect their kids to uh, India in a sense and then there's this uh, uh, what do you say um, you know a, a, neither place-ness about mm -hmm. it in a sense where sometimes it's like okay you may think that the grass is greener on the other side there's something better on the other side that's pulling you to it and you may look at it from both sides as that kind of a pull or there might be a push where you don't like something about where you are and you find that something is pushing you away uh, and so you can have both a pull and a push and so I should get that whole uh, notion of not being able to decide which place and you know, between mm -hmm. the two but in this case somehow I couldn't for Lundy's character I felt mm -hmm. like uh, she would have gone to the goblin market and stayed there maybe she'd come back to the real life once and that was it but that's and that disconnected it for me. Yeah, that makes sense. Just sort of her decisions didn't feel believable to you, yeah. especially given the way that you related to her situation. Yeah. yeah. Next up, we have Anxiety is the Dizziness of Freedom by Ted Chang. This is a story that appeared in the Exhalation Collection. And uh, so the way to describe the story is that it is, of a, it is a story of a world uh, in which a device has been invented. This device is called a prism. And the way this, this device works is there's a red LED and a blue LED in it. And when you first switch on the device, it makes a calculation. And then either the red LED goes on or the blue LED goes on. Okay. Um, now, the two uh, possibilities are supposed to be equiprobable. And in a sense, in some other dimension, another universe, uh, the opposite LED went on. So if you had a red LED go on in your life, a blue LED went on in some other uh, what is it, dimension. And this device is a device that allows communication between the pair of devices, one in the world where the red LED went on and one in the world where the blue LED went on. Okay. And... Uh, and and basically that's that's the device that's the premise of it. Uh, there's a few more details, but you know uh, you'll see that in the book. Uh, what is interesting about this is that uh, we talk all the time about uh, you know multiverses in, uh, in in science fiction where you talk about uh, parallel dimensions where you made a momentous decision and that decision basically caused two different worlds, one where you did something and one where you didn't. Here, it's not human will that's making the difference. It's this this machine that's sitting around and it forked the world, so to speak. Okay, uh, more precisely, maybe everything is forking worlds. It's just that in terms of communication, you can only communicate back and forth between the two worlds where this difference existed. Uh, why this is interesting is uh, it then follows that people are interested in communicating with other dimensions but are frequently interested in finding out how something would have gone if they had made some other choice. But since the machine is not connected to that, you have to basically hunt through a whole bunch of machines trying to find out if there exists an alternate dimension where you made a different choice. So that is one part of it that makes it interesting. Um, and the other aspect of it is that, uh, you know, the smallest changes have a butterfly effect and a lot of these worlds are diverging, but um, new machines are not terribly useful because uh, two worlds that are only two seconds diverge are not as interesting as, uh, you know, two worlds which are 15 years divergent in a sense. And, and so basically there's a notion of value of these machines and then there is an economy of that and then there are businesses set around that and that sort of thing. And it is utterly banal. I mean, it's, it's basically not a story about any one, uh, what do you say, you know, epic uh, story or anything like that. This is just a story of a world in which this machine has been invented and it is part of everyday existence. 
And, and therefore, what is really neat about the story for me is that it is a really neat what if exploration. What if this machine existed? How would humanity react to it? How would humanity be changed by the existence of such a machine? How would people interact with it? We talk about, you know, uh, addiction to social media and, you know, things like that. I mean, and we were talking about addiction to television and radio before that. But the it, it just basically starts to explore things like that as well. And it also explores this notion of people who feel the need to find out what their decision means okay it's like trying to find out it's like what if i had just done this one thing differently how would that lead out but there is no way to know that and in this case if you find a world in which you had made that other decision then maybe there is a way to know that and therefore you want to connect that to you but that is a different you it's not you and so uh, uh, and people have a hard time dealing with that um, and essentially, that's kind of what this book explores. Um, there's also a bunch of things over there, over here, about anxiety itself and about the connection between a choice and an outcome. And frequently, anxiety being framed because it's like, what if I did this? Could I have had that other outcome? And so, not letting go of the outcome, but caring about the outcome. Um, and and basically, uh, uh, there's a question of if there are a hundred dimensions and you chose this every single time, what does that say about you? Do you have free will in this scenario? Uh, these are the kinds of topics that it explores. These are the kind of themes that it goes through. Uh, and uh, Shan basically pointed out something to me about how people want to know that they were correct. And I think that is something that is also really explored a lot in this. Um, and the, the support groups and things like that. So what for me was really neat about this book is the utter banality of such a wondrous device. Um, and in terms of themes, uh, there's a lot on free will, there's a lot on things like second guessing yourself, the weight of a choice, the connection between choices and outcomes, and it was solid. Yeah, I think that Ted Chang just does such an amazing job with taking a speculative premise and exploring all of the implications and really looking at human nature and society and the way that such um, a difference would affect the way that we live life. And I think that really I agree with everything that Sush has said and it's just really fascinating to think about, you know, how would people rely on a tool like this given how much people are constantly looking for certainty when there is no certainty. Um, I think also it's just very interesting because Sush and I tend to be on opposite sides of the spectrum when it comes to anxiety about choices. Uh, I tend to be the sort of person when given a hundred minutely different choices, I say, doesn't matter which one I pick because they're all basically the same. So I don't worry about it at all. Whereas Sush is definitely the sort of person who will sit down and analyze every little option and see, you know, okay, which one has like, the benefits here or there and you know that's very much an anxiety inducing thing so it's just really interesting to see a whole story built around this idea of worrying about the impact of your choices and how people could become reliant on a machine that gave them access to something that seemed to give them insight into the effect of it but you know doesn't really so it's just like Ted Chang always does such amazing speculative fiction I also want to add one more thing to this which is that I read the story maybe like three four months back um, and I remember very little of the details of the story and I had to go look back at it yesterday to kind of remind myself I remember the themes I remember loving it but I'd forgotten a lot of the details. And in a sense, the details don't really matter. It's the exploration that is fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so this book, I think, is eminently rereadable. It, it is uh, such yeah. an enjoyable experience. It's just very much um, an exploration of an idea. So. Next is The Haunting of Tram Car 15 by P. Jelly Clark. This is such a cool little novella. It is a steampunk alternate history, a very magical and innovative story set in 1912 in Cairo, where 40 years before this point, 
a portal was opened up between the magical dimension where the jinn and other beings live and Cairo, such that many of those magical beings now live in Cairo. And it's sort of a steampunk version where there are all sorts of science and machines. Cairo is this very metropolitan uh, place that is just filled with innovation and immigrants and all sorts of really cool things. So in this setting, we have a couple of cops. We have a fresh-faced new cop, and we have kind of a tired old ministry official who just wants to handle the paperwork. Um, and they get teamed up to investigate the haunting of a tram car. And they're supposed to go figure out what's going on and exercise whatever ghost or being is haunting it. So this story is so much fun, but it also has so much depth to it in terms of what themes it explores. One of the really interesting things about this is the theme of decolonization. So Cairo in real history is something that the British Empire took over. Um, and in this alternate history, because of the opening of the dimension to where the jinn were, that didn't happen. And so this is reimagining a colonized place as some place that did not get colonized. And it's centering Arab mythology and Arab culture and all of these really cool things, putting as its center um, the strength of a place that in real life was colonized. And it's taking a genre, steampunk, which sort of celebrates the imperial Victorian uh, empire as a new genre of steampunk, which instead uses this non-colonized place. It's just a very cool theme of taking colonization and turning it on, on its head. So I really love that aspect of it. Also, there's a lot of themes of immigration in this story. So there are many beings from this magical dimension who now live and work in Cairo. And there's a lot of themes of how they're integrating into the society there. There's also immigrants from other places in the real world too. Um, but there's really interesting themes related to what happens to the immigrants and the ways that often immigrants are exploited for their labor, especially ones who may not have the same rights, um, magical beings who are not given the same rights as humans. So that's a really fascinating theme. There's also a lot of themes about women's rights and suffrage in this. So this takes place against the backdrop of a vote for women's suffrage that is happening in Cairo. And so many of the side characters are involved in the suffrage movement, and that becomes kind of a big part of what the cops get involved in. So there's so much in here that's really looking at a lot of themes that have to deal with equity and social justice that I absolutely loved. And it's all done in a way that's really filled with adventure and cool world building. So my impression of just all of P. Jelly Clark, P. Jelly Clark's work is that he can build such cool worlds in such a short period of space while also building characters that you care about and a story that just moves through this wonderful world and has something to say. So I found that this novel was so readable, so much fun, and just the complexity of that world building and the themes that he explored with just really kind of making fiction something transformative, where he is centering marginalized voices and making them the whole focus of the story. Uh, I just, I really love what he does with his work and I thoroughly enjoyed this book. I really want to underscore what you mentioned about uh, how good P. Jelly Clark is in world building so much with so little. Uh, this is, I think, one of my favorite things about P. Jelly Clark's writing. Uh, I have found myself saying frequently, I wish this book, which is a novella, were a novel so that it had like 300, 400 pages in order to explore something better and do a better job of world building. Uh, P. Jelly Clark shows that you, this is very much a thing of skill where you can actually do pack in that much world building so efficiently. Uh, so absolutely love that. Uh, also uh, related to world building is the 
background and the mm -hmm. backdrop. There's so many interesting things that are happening in the backdrop, which contribute to this world building. But it's kind of very, very important. The, the plot of the story moves the story along, but it's the backdrop that is just delicious. Um, the women's suffrage movement, for example, uh, trying to uh, have progressive uh, changes happen in an environment which is traditionalist while still trying to connect to your traditions. Mm -hmm. uh, all of this is done so well. I, I, I just love uh, reading this book. Yeah, and it's, it's so cool because it's alternate history and it's magic and it's just, it's such a fantastical ride and he does such a great job of having a good tight plot while getting all of this world building in. It's a very full novel filled with just wonderfulness, so I absolutely loved it. And finally, we have The Deep by River Solomon, David Diggs, William Hudson, and Jonathan Snipes. And um, one of the things that um, I really like about this uh, book is something that's mentioned in the afterword of the book, which is that this book is the result of a game of artistic telephone. And basically, you start with essentially a background that was created in the 1990s by a group called Drexia, which was uh, an electro-techno uh, group, so to speak, which created a backdrop of a world where um, pregnant African women were thrown overboard from slave ships uh, crossing the Atlantic. And uh, the, the, the babies uh, essentially evolve into a merfolk and basically go on to create a utopia of their own. And in a sense, this is essentially a world trying to make something good from a background of great evil. And essentially that is one of the, uh, that is uh, the backdrop of the story in a sense. And then um, after that comes the band Clipping, which comprises of David Diggs, William Hudson and Jonathan Snipes which kind of tries to expand on that story with uh, a, a, a song called uh, The Deep, uh, which was also Hugo nominated a few years back. And uh, basically they try to imagine a next generation of that, so to speak, and basically talk about interaction with surface dwellers and things like that. I will not go into that further. Uh, that's something that you can check out on YouTube or you can read this book. The Deep, which also kind of enfolds that story in and then builds on top of that. So, so in a sense, it builds on many layers because it is a story that is based with a fairly rich background, but it also establishes that background and colors it in, so to speak. Um, and and it, at, at the beginning of the story, in a sense, this is a story of a character called Yetu, uh, who is a historian uh, for her people. And basically the job of a historian is essentially to uh, remember all the generational trauma and all the generational memories of the people. And the idea here is that uh, the historian uh, holds on to all of these memories so that the general mer people don't have to. Um, and, but this lack of this knowledge, the lack of this memory does cause a feeling of emptiness within, within them and they feel unmoored. And so once a year, the historian is supposed to share these memories with all the people so that they can feel connected to their identity. But at the same time, this is very painful for them and not something that they can withstand. So at the end of this, the historian is supposed to take away those memories back into themselves and so that uh, the people can continue to live on. And in that sense, this is very much a story of uh, a, a person being uh, appointed, in a sense, uh, to suffer for the needs of the many. Okay, um, And so there is there's definitely a notion over here of uh, what is the ethics of having such a person. Uh, there is a notion of ethics of consent. There is a notion also, though, of when you have generational trauma like that, which is what forms your identity, can you then uh, move on from that? Okay. Do you need to ignore it in order to get on with your life? But in so ignoring, do you lose connection to yourself? So I think that's such a neat idea that has been explored in a great amount of detail here. 
but then besides all this greater stuff that is explored, it is also the intensely personal story of Yetu about uh, how she deals with this kind of arrangement, uh, about what she yearns for, what is her goals, what is her personal preference and you know that sort of a thing. And so it's a deeply personal story as well. And also there's a notion of uh, what is the price of connection with family, okay, uh, versus what is the price of freedom in that sense. When you have one, do you yearn for the other? And, you know, that's sort of an exploration as well. And there is an inherent duality in that that this book kind of sits with. I don't know that it uh, makes judgments, it sits with it. And I really, really enjoyed and liked that aspect of it, okay. Um, so it's a very richly layered story. It basically talks about multiple generations and trying to find out what works in a sense. Uh, it talks about responsibility, about duty, but at the same time, what is fair and what is right. Um, and this is just a thoroughly enjoyable story for me. Uh, there's also one more thing that I kind of want to mention here, which is that there are, for me, I also find a duality of stories. Uh, ones that have a lot of meaning and a lot of theme and convey a lot of impact, uh, but they're not enjoyable reading themselves. It's something that you kind of have to force yourself to read in a mm. sense. On the other hand, there's a lot of stories, even some of my favorite stories, which are thoroughly consumable. And even if they deal with some themes, they are not kind of like that is not necessarily the point of the story and they're it's, just fun reads they're just fun reads yeah. and it's it, and a lot of stories try to do both i think this story is for me uh the best attempt at going the furthest distance in both of these directions that i've seen in a long long time uh it's it's it, this book was for me a phenomenal read uh in quite a few years in a sense yeah, I think that um, this book is not something which is necessarily plot heavy, but it is something which is extremely character development heavy. So I think if you're a reader who is looking for plot, this may not be necessarily the book for you, but um, Sush and I are both a lot more about the world building and about the characters and about the themes. And this book just really does blend all of that together in such a beautiful form. I think that in addition to a lot of these discussions about generational trauma and about the burden of that and who should bear it and whether um, communities should hold on to that or whether they should forget it. In addition to all of that really interesting discussion, there's also just such an interesting discussion of Yetu specific um, kind of experiences because Yetsu is very much someone who is neuroatypical and she is very, very sensitive. She has a lot of kind of heavy reactions to the burden that these memories have on her such that it's sort of eating her up inside. And I think one of the really interesting things that this story does um, that I want to see more stories do is it centers that disability as something that also not just um, challenges her, but also is the reason why she is so much better at this job than the rest of her community, why she is so much more able through her disability to handle a lot of this. So there's just a real um, focus on empowering uh, that disability that I think more stories should do, um, although mo most stories kind of do the opposite of making disability something that it just needs, needs to be, be fixed. Needs to be fixed. Yes. Whereas yes. in this, this is it's maybe something that is challenging for Yetu, but it's also the source of her um, strength in this. And it's just I really loved that aspect of Yetu's character. I loved the exploration of how she worked through. Um, all of these issues and sort of came to terms with the way that she wanted to empower herself and make decisions about what was going on. 
So consent is such a big theme in this and I just really liked how that was explored. So I was thoroughly engaged when I read this. I was so deeply connected to Yetu as a character um, and her growth throughout the story is, is just such an important journey um, as well as just all of the bigger social justice issues that the book discussed. So I think for Sush and me, this is just an example of that kind of, again, transformative fiction where you use a speculative situation and world to explore really human topics. Um, and it was just very, very moving and engaging and such a great story. One more thing I'll mention here. Uh, the audiobook is read by David Diggs and I absolutely love the audiobook version of this. So I do recommend that if you like audiobooks. So those were our thoughts on the finalists for the Hugo Novella category for 2020. If you've read any of these books or you have any thoughts on them, go ahead and leave me a comment down below. Or if you would rank these in a different order or you read some other 2019 release that you wish had made the uh, finalist category for novellas, I'd love to hear about it. Sush and I will be reading the novels, novelettes, and short story categories as well. So over the next couple of months, we'll do some discussion videos of those and how we rank them. So we're really looking forward to it. Each year we enjoy reading the finalists in these Hugo categories, uh, getting an idea of what's being published right Right now in the SFF genre and just discussing all of the cool things that we read. So we'd love to hear what you think as well.